in a valley you understand what that song means to you and to us. I have three verses of Scripture I want to read from three different books of the Bible today. Romans chapter 12, Colossians chapter 3, and Mark chapter 12. Romans 12, Colossians 3, and Mark 12. And hopefully they will be on the screen in case you can't quite get there or you can't mark all those places today. Mark chapter 12, verse 11 says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That middle phrase is what I want to call your attention to, where it says, fervent in spirit. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Notice that phrase, do it heartily. As to the Lord and not unto men. Amen. Lastly, Mark 11, verse, or Mark 12, verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Notice that phrase. And with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Fervent in spirit, do it heartily. Love the Lord with all of your heart. Now I want to come to you this morning and make a confession. My confession is I have worried a little bit about how you are receiving what I'm preaching. Now when I first came into the church of God, I had to learn some uh, church of God terminology. I had to learn a church of God culture. One of the things that I used to hear people say often was, Woo, we had a good service. There wasn't no preaching. I don't understand what they were saying. They were saying that the Holy Ghost moved in such a way. He, he preached himself. How many knows the Holy Ghost can preach better than I can? So I understood what they were saying. But, but the question is, can we have a good service and have preaching. Can we have a good service and hear the word of the Lord and receive the word of the Lord and then walk out of this room and ask the Lord, how do I apply what I just heard to my life? How do I walk out what I just heard the man of God say in that place? And so I don't know what maybe you deem as a good service. Maybe you're like them. And it's only a good service if there's no preaching. But I, I've worried a little bit about how you receive what I have been saying to you. We've been talking about some important things. I believe as the Lord is trying to help me lay foundation for what we're going to do and where we're going to go. What will fill this house? We've talked about how that there are going to be a certain uh, group of people walk through our doors. People that have allowed other people or other things to come between them and God. They became more important to them in their life than God was. And they're going to walk through the door. Something's going to compel them to come through the door of the church. And we need to get ready for that. We need to understand there are going to be people who are infirmed. Now, not necessarily a physical infirmity, but they're infirmed by some spirit that has affected their physical body. There are people who are harboring unforgiveness, people who are living with bitterness, and that has created a physical issue in their body, but it's really not a physical issue. It's something inside they've never dealt with. And God said, people like that are going to walk through this door. There are people who are who are who are lame it doesn't mean they're paralyzed it means that they they are hindered in their walk people have allowed stuff to hinder their walk with jesus and they're going to walk through these doors people who are blind people have lost their vision people have lost their faith in god people who have lost their ability to dream and believe they're going to walk through these doors then we talked about how that when they walk through these doors, they need to know this place is filled with, with a repentant attitude. That this is a good place to come to repent, to turn your back on the way you've been walking and to walk a different direction. Everybody needs to repent. This needs to be a place of mercy. 
mercy does not give you what you deserve. If, if we all had to pay for our sin, it would be terrible. But mercy was given to us. We too also ought to give and extend mercy. This is a place of love, godly love, agape love. We talked about that last week, what agape love is. It's a place of anointing, a place that is rubbed on and smeared on and we're covered with the anointing of God. But the anointing is not just for us to get goosebumps. And have the hair stand up on our arm. The anointing is that God will enable us to do in the realm of the Spirit what we cannot accomplish in this flesh. It is for the purpose of the kingdom. This week the Lord has dealt with me about something else. I I could have just as easily called this, this week, what will fill this house, part number four. But I was worried that if I did that, some of you would go ahead and cut me off, said I've heard enough of that. So I have a different title for you today. I want to talk about keeping our passion. Now, you see, all this makes sense. It all goes together. Are y'all offended if I take my coat off? If you're offended, forgive me. It's bothering me for some reason today. I wanted to talk about keeping our passion. To me, all this goes together. There are going to be people walk through these doors with all kind of baggage and all kind of issues. When they come in, they've got to come into a place that has a culture of repentance and love and mercy and anointing. But then I thought, as the Lord began to deal with me, there's one more thing that people need to find inside the house of God. You know what that is? He needs to find people who are passionate about God. Passionate about Jesus. Again, my wife and I, we've talked about this a lot, how it seems that you, you love each other and it seems that you love Jesus. What else would possess people to go out and stand in the heat on the road and hold the sign? Unless they love Jesus and they love people and they want to see people and give an invitation for people to come inside the door. What would possess people to get up early and go to a nursing home and do ministry before church ever starts? What would possess people to watch after your babies? While you only get to be in the sanctuary where the Spirit of God's moving and the choir sings under the anointing and they're back there tending to your babies. What would cause that? What would cause people to be up on the hill watching after children? He said, somehow we have a passion for every age. We have a passion for souls. We have a passion for people. Listen. I got to thinking about passion. My wife and I will be married 35 years this year. I had to look to make sure. We went to a marriage retreat one time, and they gave us a thing, said, put your name on the tag, how many years you've been married? She wrote her name and the years, I wrote my name and the years, and I just happened to look, and her number didn't match mine. (laughs) And I was right. And she was wrong. But I got to thinking about married life. Before we ever got to enjoy the married life, before we ever got to enjoy the wedding day or the wedding night or the wedding life, there was all this other stuff. We had to go to marriage counseling. We had to sit and listen to a pastor talk to us about things we needed to watch out for and, and about all these things that we needed to do. And we sat through those. And, and then we had to go through shopping for a home. And then, then we had to shop for septic tanks. I'm talking about other stuff. We had to, we had to shop for rock to line our driveway. We had to have a deck built on the front of our little 12 by 54 mobile home. I'm just saying, there was other stuff before we ever got to the married life. I just want to tell you today, there's a whole lot of stuff that comes along with being married for Jesus. 
and married with Jesus. There's a whole lot of things called life that comes in our way. And life sometimes has a way of absolutely kind of throwing us for a loop. And it sucks the passion out of our life. And this is what I came today to encourage you. I came to encourage you that while we love God, we have to be careful not to allow stuff in this life to drain us of our passion and our love for God, our love for Jesus, our love for the Holy Ghost. We must always have a passion for Him. Romans chapter 11, 12 verse 11 from the message says, don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 of the message says, so the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. Notice those words there. He said, keep yourself fueled and aflame. Love the Lord with all your passion. If there's anything that I want to see happen to the congregants of this church, of, of, of my congregation, I want to see you always in love with Jesus. I want to see you passionate about God, about Jesus, about His Spirit. Listen, people are passionate about all kinds of stuff. We're passionate about fishing and hunting and bowling and golf and football. I know there's some Georgia people in here. Some Gamecock people in here. My son-in-law was trying to buy a Gamecock chair at Walmart last night. I told him that's the ugliest color I've ever... I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. We're passionate. People will paint their face purple and wear orange hair. But if you are passionate about Jesus, they call you a fanatic. Something's wrong. Something's wrong that we can be passionate about all this stuff in the world. But when it comes to Jesus, we're supposed to sit back and be reserved, twiddle our thumbs. No, he died for me. No, he shed his blood for me. No, he washed my sins away. Excuse me if I get a little ab. Excuse me if I sway when they're singing. It's because he died for me. If we want people who are going to walk through that door with all their problems and baggage, they got to run into people who, are, who it is evident that their lives have been changed. And when they ask us, we are able to tell them our story. He is good, good, whoa. Testimony about God's goodness through eight brain surgeries. This morning during fellowship time before church started, a lady came up to me and she said, I just want to testify about two things God had done. I was two minutes from death, but God woke me up. Oh, y'all ain't happy about it like she was. Two minutes from dying, but God showed up and raised her up and gave her life back. <laughs> There she is right there. She's happy about it. Hallelujah. She said the doctors were telling her that she was going to have to have hearing aids. But she said a couple Sundays ago while she was in the service, she said it sounded like freight trains in her ears. And she's going back to the doctor and says, no need for hearing aids. Y'all, I'm trying to tell you, this is what we need to be passionate about. The reason why people will want what we have is because it's alive in us. It is vibrant in us. It is real to us. It is as fresh today as it was the day He saved me, the day He sanctified me, the day He filled me with His sweet Holy Ghost. It is as powerful. It is as fresh. It is as new as it's ever been. We must be people of passion. Amen. But there are things in this life that literally will drain 
the passion out of you. This is what I want to talk to you about this morning. I'm telling you because I want you to guard against it. And I'm telling you that it could actually be happening to you right now and you don't recognize it. It's happening ever so slowly, ever so suddenly. Here's the first one. Here's the first thing that will drain the, the passion out of you. An unbalanced schedule. This is what I know about some young folk that's got little children. We run everywhere. There were times when my daughter and son both played a sport. And luckily they played at the same place. They played on different fields. And there were times where we were running back and forth, up the hill, down the hill. And she was with one, I was with the other. And then we'd run up and down the hill and swap and this one and that one. And we were running here and running there. Thank God it was only seasonally. It's not like it is now where it's year long. I'm so glad it was April to the first week of June and it was over. But I want you to hear me today. One of the greatest drains on you and your passion will be an unbalanced schedule. God created us to have some sort of balance. What happens many times is we get out of balance and it messes with us. You can be so busy that you don't have time to read the Word anymore. You can get so busy you don't have time to pray anymore. You can get so busy you can't even fit church in anymore. And we get so busy and we wonder God where and we blame everybody else. We blame the preacher. He just he didn't preach the word today. We blame the musicians and the and the worship leader. They should have sung this song. They they should have sung that style. We blame the Sunday school teacher. They should have brought in all these other points. They're just not getting the job done. No, brothers and sisters. The issue is we've gotten so busy we wouldn't know God if He walked up and slapped us in the face. We're so busy. It will cause you to lose your passion. Psalm 127 verse 2 says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sheep. sheep. New Living Translation says it like this, It is useless for you to work so hard. From early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to those he loves or to his loved ones. He's not saying be lazy. He's not saying don't work to provide for your family. He's saying what happens is if you're trying to do it all yourself, you're going to work from morning to night and you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out. I'm not a real good one to talk about this one. Sometimes your wife, your husband, your children would rather have time with you than the money you're earning to provide for you. Sometimes they would just rather you sit at the table and eat with them. It's quiet, and I understand what that means. But, but as much as our family would, don't you know our Heavenly Father would love to spend some time with you? Don't you think he would love it in the morning if you'd take time instead of reading the third newspaper? I'm reading three right now. I'm trying to decide if I need to read the Aiken paper or the Augusta paper. And I'm still reading the paper from back home. I've added to my reading collection, but, but do I take time to read the Word of God? Do I take time to hear the voice of God? Do I take time to, to rest in His presence? One of the greatest things I ever saw, I went to Pastor's Conference at Brooklyn Tabernacle. And I heard Pastor Jim Simula talk about one of his practices. And the time he spends with God, he says, I have a recliner. And he said, I sit in the recliner. And he said, I open the Word and I lay it in my lap. And I just sit. And he said, people look at me and say, that's crazy. You should be reading the Word. He said, don't you know it, that I love it? When my grandchildren just come up and sit in my lap, they don't have to say one word to me. They're just sitting with me. A while ago, Riley Grace 
slid up next to me, slid her arm inside my arm, and put her head on my shoulder. She didn't say a word, but I was like a cat purring. Do you know what it would mean to God our Father? If even in those moments that we're lost for words and don't know what to pray, if, if we're at a loss from words of what we ought to read, that we would just sit in His presence, if we would just sit there and say, okay, God, you mean more to me than the paper. You mean more to me than the news. You mean more to me right now than anything else. I just want to sit right here in Your presence. You would be amazed that in the silence, God begins to speak. But we're busy. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 6, 25 to 31. Therefore I say unto you, don't worry about your life. What you'll eat or what you'll drink or what about your body and, and what you're going to put on it is not life more than food than the body, than uh, more for clothing. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap, gather into barns, that your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which t today is, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not worry. What we shall eat, or what we shall drink, or what we shall wear. Jesus was not saying, don't work. Jesus was not advocating, let everybody else take care of you. What Jesus was advocating is don't forget where everything comes from. Every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from the Father Everything you have is a gift of God. Everything you have is a blessing from the hand of God. Don't forget it. Work, yes. Labor, yes. Provide, yes. But don't do it at the expense of your family. And don't do it at the expense of your relationship with God. Can I tell you the flip side of that? Not only can we be busy, we can be so guilty of giving out and 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 we never take in you can get so busy in ministry that you're always giving and you're never receiving it's unbalanced there'll be times when I will not stand behind this pulpit and preach it's not because I couldn't find a word there's sometimes when the preacher needs to be preached to Come on now. I'm human. I have my own issues. I have my own struggles. And sometimes I need to hear a word from the Lord too. Unbalanced. Always giving out, never taking in. There are also people like this. They're always receiving and never giving. I don't know if there are any here, but there have been churches I've been involved in where they never miss a service. They hear every word, every preach. They've got a note. They took notes for everybody who ever gave a word. They've become spiritually fat and don't do one thing with what they've heard. They don't have any ministry. They don't do anything. They just hoard it all and don't give anything. That's out of balance. It'll suck the passion right out of you. I want to make sure that you are healthy, passionate about the Lord. James chapter 2 verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. New Living Translation says, Faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It's one thing to say, I love Jesus. It's one thing to glean from His Word. But if we don't take the Word and make application so that through our life, the works of God begin to produce out of us, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Why are you talking like this today? Because 
when those people walk through that door. Who have an infirmity. When those people walk through the door who, who have no faith in God because they've been blinded. When they walk through the door having love for other things more than God. They're going to have to be greeted by people who are passionate about God. They're going to have to come on Wednesday night and be taught by people who are passionate about God. They need to watch people sing. Who are passionate about God. They need to hear somebody preach. Who is passionate about God. Anything out of balance will drain. I like 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Refuse profane old wives' fables. Exercise thyself. Exercise thyself. I like that verse of Scripture that says, uh, bodily exercise profiteth little. Paul is writing to Timothy. And he's not talking about exercising with dumbbells and, and getting on, on, on treadmills and riding bicycles. He's talking about your faith, your walk. Listen to it from the message. Stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up as religion. Exercise daily in God. Notice this. No spiritual flabbiness. Please. This is how you keep from losing your passion. You work at it every day. Unbalanced. Here, here's a second thing that will drain your, your passion. An unused talent or gift. I personally believe every single person has a gifting given to them by God. I've met some people, their gift is to gab. Those are the people you put on the telephone and let them just talk. They're the people who have the gift to speak. Maybe they're not called to be a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, but, but they can speak. They know how to word the, themselves and it, and, it, and it speaks volumes to people. We all have a gift. There's some that have talents and gifts. But what will drain you is knowing that you have a gift and a talent and you are not using it for the king of all glory. Now you may not even look at what you do as a gift. We started doing a Christmas program. And for the first year we rented stuff. And we realized that's not going to work too good. And so we found out where we could buy some patterns. And, and we went to another church that had a similar program. And we looked at what they had. And we began to get ideas of what to do. And we gathered some ladies in the church who were gifted to sew. And you may say, well, now, I've never looked at that as a gift. It was a, a gift to us. And what we asked them, we gave them a pattern. We gave them material. And we said, don't you bring this back until first you've laid your hands on it. And you've anointed it. And you've prayed over it. Which, what that meant was is that every single person who wore one of these robes to do this Christmas program were wearing a robe that was made with anointed hands that had been prayed over and anointed with oil and had, had the prayer of the Holy Ghost all over it. Don't tell me God can't give you a gift and you can't use it for Him. My son played the drums. And he played in church a little bit and then one, one went through a little spell where he said, I'm not going to play in church. But he wanted to play in the band at school. Woodruff, uh, their, their uh, mascot is the Wolverines. And this is what I told my son. I told my son, you're not going to play for the Wolverines and not play for the Nazarene. If you want to play for them, you're going to play in church. He said, well, I don't have no drums to play on. Bless God, I got him a vintage set, 1972 Rogers. Put him new heads on it, clean the rust off, off the edges. 
and let him practice and play for Jesus? Why would we want to use our gift and our talents for the world and not use them for the one who saved us and gave it to us to start with? Maybe you've not had an opportunity. Maybe nobody's given you an opportunity. Listen, just because you think you can sing, uh-oh, don't necessarily mean you can sing. Now, the Bible does say make a joyful noise, but make that at home. <laughs> make it in the shower. Come on, y'all know I'm playing now. What I'm saying to you is, is that if you have a gifting and a calling, it'll drain you if you're not using it for the master, if you're not using it for the kingdom. I'm telling you, maybe you can't do it at church, but you can do it at the nursing home. You can do it down somewhere else. God will use us if we will allow Him to do it. I read somewhere in studying this week that 70% of people in the job market 70% of the people in the job market are, are in a job that does not allow them to use their skill set or their gifting. You want to know why so many people are miserable? It's not their boss, their supervisor. It's not what they're getting paid. It's because they are not able to use their gifting. I've come to tell you today, there's a place in the kingdom for your gift. There's a place in the kingdom for your talent. We might not have it yet, but it does not mean that we cannot create it. It does not mean that we don't need it. You just need to talk. Let's pray. Let's figure out how we go about it, how we do it, and we will find a place for you to use your gifting and your talent for the kingdom. Here's the third thing that'll drain you. And y'all ain't gonna like this. Unconfessed sin. Now we talked about repentance last week. But this truth. If there's something going on in our lives and we have not gotten it right with God, we have not confessed it, we have not brought it to the Lord, unconfessed sin will literally suck the passion out of your life for serving the Lord. I heard recently somebody say, we done let sin come into the camp. Wasn't here. And I just want to go ahead and tell you, I do not possess the power to keep sin out of the camp. I, I don't possess the ability to keep people from going into sin. That's the Holy Ghost job. The Holy Ghost is a convictor. The Holy Ghost is one who elevates and promotes Jesus. It is the Holy Ghost's job to speak to you if you are trying to commit sin, to come to you and to convince you don't do it. He's the voice that's saying no, 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 no. And then he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And then when you've done it, he's going, oh, 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 oh. And he brings conviction to our life. Brothers and sisters, if there are things in our life we have not put under the blood of Jesus, we cannot have passion. We will never be able to help people walking through the door if they find a passionless person. And it's because I've committed some sin and I've not been willing to put it under the blood of Jesus. Let me tell you what I think. I don't think it's possible to feel enthusiasm and guilt at the same time. I'm going to say it again. I don't think you can feel enthusiasm and passion and guilt at the same time. That's why we can come in church and we're in church and everybody else is smiling and clapping and woo! And we're sitting there like, it ain't happening today. The problem's not with God. The problem's not with the singers. The problem's not with the musicians. The problem may not even be with the pastor. The problem could be there's sin that we have not dealt with yet unconfessed sin will literally suck the passion out of you. David said in Psalm 38 and 4, for mine iniquities are gone over my head. 
as a heavy burden that are too heavy for me. Psalm 38, 6, I'm troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. This is David. Because sin had come into his life. And he's saying, listen, it is so bothering me. Guilt's kind of like a computer crashing. You ever had a computer crash? Don't you just love that? Never had a good time. Never when you've backed up anything. Guilt's like a computer crashing. Your computer works and works and works and works and works and works. And then all of a sudden, it crashes. And that's kind of how way guilt is. Guilt is something we live with it and we live with it and we suppress it and we put it back and we live with it. And, we, and then all of a sudden, one day we crash. We need to confess. That's why we love the scripture, 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll give you another one. And we won't like this one either. Here's, here's a fourth one. Unresolved conflict. <laughs> you, you know what this is, right? You and somebody had words. You and somebody had a difference about how something should happen and it's caused you to where you don't even want to talk to them. You don't want to sit on the same row with them. Unresolved conflict. It will drain the absolute passion out of you. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the only time you and your spouse disagree is on a Sunday? I'm the only one. Why does that happen? Do you think it's a coincidence? No! The Lord, the, the enemy understands that if we can come together in unity and agreement into the house of God, nothing is impossible. Why does he work with unresolved conflict? 1 Peter 3 and 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. He's talking about your wife, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, the grace of this life, that your prayers not be hindered. One rendering says, treat her as you should so your prayers won't be hindered. If a disagreement with my spouse will hinder my prayers, what do you think a disagreement with a brother and sister will do in your walk with Christ? It'll suck the passion right out of what, what was it Jesus said? Jesus said it like this uh, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He said, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Jesus said, I'm going to bring my offering. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They're calling for the offering. The ushers are going to stand at the front today. And I'm supposed to bring my offering. And I run up there. And while I'm running up there, the Holy Ghost says, wait a minute, you and Bob, you and, you and James, you and Jimmy, you and... I'm trying to make sure I'm not calling by his name. You and Bobo, you and, you and Hickey Doo had an argument. And I don't want you offering right now. I want you to go and get it right. The Lord says, I'll tell you what you do. Leave your offering at the altar. And go to Bob, Bob, Billy, Bob, Hickabob. And make it right. Do you, do you understand when you read that, it, doesn't, it never says who was right and who was wrong. Because it don't matter. It's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about getting it right. Because at the time, your offering won't accomplish one thing if you're out of line. Before it can be given right and before it can be received right, you got to get unresolved conflict fixed. I'm preaching good even though y'all quiet. So, Brother Terry, do you know something I don't know? No, I don't. I'm just giving you what the Holy Ghost spoke to me this way. Maybe none of this is any of our issue. But what I'm trying to help you understand is if it ain't happening today, it may happen tomorrow. And I want to give you what you need. So when it happens, you're not lost. You understand what the Word teaches. Get unresolved conflict fixed. 
Let me give you one more and I'll be done. A lack of spiritual support. When I say spiritual support, I'm not talking about the lack of what God will do for you, what Jesus will do for you, what the Holy Ghost will do for you. I'm talking about what brothers and sisters can do for you. This is, this is what I've seen happen. Sometimes all of our friends are people outside the church. And a lot of those people are unsaved people. And, and I'm not saying that that's not a good thing because the way we're going to win them is for them to understand we're common folk and we like to have a good time. And at the same time we have a good time, we can be saved, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled. We don't have to cuss and drink and run around with women and run around with people who chew and all kind of other stuff. We can have fun and serve the Lord. But sometimes people are so around lost people that there's no support to their life. But brother, tell you, the truth is, when I'm having a tough time, uh, it's lost people who come to me uh, quicker than, than saved people. And that may be true, and shame on them. But what are they offering you for support? What are they giving you as, as encouragement? I want somebody who can give me a word from the Lord. I want somebody who can lay hands and pray for me. I want somebody who can guide me through and show me the straight and narrow and keep me focused on the King of glory. Sometimes being around people who have no spiritual support for us drains the very life out of us. I think my sister used this verse today, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. And if they fall, one will lift his fellow. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. Two are better than one. And it's not just any one. It's somebody who understands. Somebody who knows. Somebody who walks. Somebody who labors. Somebody who is just like me. And if I fall, they are there to pick me up. They are there to help me. They are there to help me live. You need brothers and sisters that will hold you accountable, who will give you words of encouragement. I love it when people send me text. And sometimes they don't say anything. It's just a scripture. I'm so thankful for people who will take the time just to send me a word of encouragement from the Word. Not your opinion, not your thought process, not what you heard on Fox News or CNN or some other place, but what the Lord said. I love it when they say, I had you on my mind today, and this is what the Lord said. Boom, give me a word. That keeps my passion burning for the Lord. I want people who are passionate. Well, Brother Terry, you're right. This was one of them good services. Why was it not good? What did I tell you that wasn't good? What did I tell you that wasn't right? What did, I, what did I offer you that could not encourage you, that could help you? I'm trying to help us be ready. Listen, one thing you're going to find out to me, I love to dream. I love to sit around the table. I love to think about the future. I met with, come on, Sister Tracy. I met with Sister Tracy. This week, and she talked about a vision the Lord had given her some time ago. And she said, I saw myself standing in front of a huge choir. And my wife and I said, well, let's get ready for it. Well, that was weak. Prepare for it. Where are we going to put them? Well, one thing we got to do is figure out where to put that box. <laughs> Brother Jack's already working on a plan. You can laugh if you want, but I'm telling you, if we're going to dream about what God's going to do, let's go ahead and prepare for it. So when it happens, we're not caught off guard. Where are we going to park people when they fill the chairs? Where are we going to put more people? How is it going to happen when we got so many people, we can't get them in here? How are we going to go to two services? Come on! It, can anybody dream? To do it, you got to have passion. You've got to have a passion for Jesus. You've got to have a passion to believe that with God, nothing is impossible. This is what I tell people all the time. When we stand before the Lord, 
you can't stand with me. You can't stand before me with me before the Lord and say, Lord, he was, he was so sorry. I can't stand with you before the Lord. You know what's going to happen? You're going to stand there by yourself. And you will give an account for your life. I will stand by myself. I will give an account for my life. What I can do is I can stand before you and give you the word of God and encourage you that in every place you go, every day of your life, do what you can do to keep your passion. One of the things my wife and I love to do, and we're already working towards this to happen next year. We love to, to, to pull together couples. And we do a marriage retreat. The reason why this got so heavy on our heart was because there was a particular time where we had four couples going through a divorce at the same time. And one of them was like the War of the Roses. It was terrible. And I was thinking, Lord, help us somehow help people. And what we realized is that sometimes in the busyness of this life, we live in the same house but we don't ever talk to each other. Come on. We don't even eat together. We, we eat different times and different rooms and we don't ever sit at the table and eat together. The truth is there's really no passion in our marriage. And so I said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go somewhere away from the church we're going to go to a place that's far enough away that they got to leave their kids with somebody. And we're going to spend time. Yes, we'll do a little training. Yes, we'll do a little teaching. But we're going, to, we're going to make there be so much time that husbands and wives can spend together. Probably more important than what we teach you or give to you is to give you the opportunity to spend time together. One of the greatest things we could provide for you is an opportunity to share with you and to tell you that you need to spend time with God. In these marriage retreats, what happens is, is sometimes where there has been no passion, passion returns. It's what's got to happen in the church. It's what's got to happen with people. That where maybe we've gone through the motions and we've just become everything we do, and we just perform it. That there's no passion there. I know I'm supposed to read, so I read my Bible. I open it up, Jesus well, I close it back. And I say I read my Bible today, but I didn't get anything from it. I didn't hear him speak to me from it. I, I didn't hear him touch me from it. I didn't hear him direct me from it. I didn't, I didn't, hear, I didn't feel empowered by it. I just did it as a function. And God is saying... What I'd like for you to do, if you can't say anything to me, if you don't even feel directed to read anything, would you just put your word in my lap, in your lap, and sit in my presence? There are a lot of times when husbands and wives don't even know how to talk to each other, and they'll ride four hours from where we were up to Pigeon Forge. They were in the same car, but they were sitting in each other's presence. And many times there was nothing said, but over the hours, they'd reach over and grab the other one's hand. I'm just telling you. When we see people walk through that door, from every kind of baggage and background, and we say we're promoting repentance and love and mercy and anointing, it's got to come from people who have a passion for their master, who have a relationship with their master, who is willing to spend time with God and say, God, is there any unresolved conflict in my life? Lord, is there any un unconfessed sin in my life? Lord, am I just too busy? Lord, Lord am I out of balance? Brother Terry, I, I, I wish you'd preach on the Holy Ghost. I will, but I want to tell you, you got to have it right here before the Holy Ghost can come in here. listen, I'm not saying that anybody has anything wrong. 
If I haven't done anything else but given you a list that you'll hide in the back of your Bible somewhere, and when those times come and the Spirit of God begins talking to you, it'll be, it'll, you'll be reminded, listen, Pastor Terry told me about this, this busyness, about this out of balance. He, the Holy Spirit's dealing with me about an unresolved conflict. And all of a sudden, it, it begins to hit you in the head. This is why my passion is waning. i got to get this fixed. i got sin in my life. Sometimes we're guilty of only looking at great big things as sin. You know, stealing, killing. And yet the Word declares if you know to do good and you don't do it, it's a sin. So, so I'm, I just want to know, is there anybody in the room today who is adamant about being passionate? Maybe you are passionate and you want to say to God, Lord, I'm coming today because I don't want to lose what I got. There are always people going on our marriage retreats who have good marriages. But what they're saying is, is while we got a good marriage, we understand that the devil wants to fight against marriage. And if he can fight against marriage, if he can kill the marriage, he'll kill the church. Because as the family goes, the church goes. Father God, in your mighty name, today, you know I struggled because being new here and wanting so desperately, Lord, to preach in ways that make people be attracted to the way I preach. But Lord, I'm called by you to preach the word. I give an account to you for what I preach and how I preach, Lord. And, and while I struggle with it today, Lord, I, have, I stand here with no reserve about what I've preached because I know your Spirit spoke to me about this. I believe everything we're doing is still preparatory. We're still working on the foundation. We're still trying to lay it all out. We're trying to get it all settled so that when we start to build on what we're laying out right now, Lord, it is all going to, to come up straight. It's going to be in plumb. It's going to be exactly what it needs to be because, Lord, we're doing it according to your plan and your purpose. Lord, today we're going to open up these altars. Lord, I, I hope that there's several groups of people that come today. I hope there are people that come today who are passionate. They know they're passionate. They know they love you, Lord. They're excited about you. They're on fire for you. But they're going to come today and say, Lord, oh, guard my heart. Guard my mind. Guard my spirit. Don't allow me to let the busyness of this life to take away what I have. Don't let me, Lord, have conflict with anyone. Oh, Lord, keep me away from sin. Be like David who said, let me hide the word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Let us come as people who are so concerned about the passion we have that you want to help us to guard it I pray that there'll be others who come today and say you know what I, I knew my passion was waning I just didn't I didn't quite understand where it was coming from I didn't know what was happening but today I see it and whatever the spirit of God is speaking to you about that you'll deal with that you'll handle that you'll, you'll take care of that and then the Lord will give you a freshness give you a fresh dose of his passion and his spirit today. maybe there are others in the room who have a gift a talent and you've struggled in this life because you've not used it for the king maybe you didn't know how you didn't know where listen everything that God gives us as a gift and talent doesn't have to happen inside the walls of the church I think sometimes that's what we think, that we all have to do it inside the church. But sometimes the gifting God gives us is not for the inside of the church, it's for outside the church. And God, whatever it is that you're speaking to people, I pray, God, that they'll come as an act of surrender to you, saying, Lord, I know I, you gave me this gift. I know you gave me this talent. And Lord, I've held it, and I've hoarded it, and I've put it in the closet, and I've kept it in reserve. But Lord, today... I'm telling you, I want to use what you've given me for your glory. I want, to, I, want to be, I want my passion to be what it needs to be. And it can't be, Lord, if I'm unusing my gift, not using my gift. Lord, let there be people that come around this altar today. Let passion emanate from us. Let jubilance emanate from us. 
Let happiness emanate from us. Let the peace of God emanate from us. And use that, Lord, to speak to people who need you. I pray it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Everybody standing all over the room today. Listen, if you're passionate about Him, and you're, 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 you're absolutely serious about wanting to maintain your passion, and you want to ask God to help you protect that, I'm asking you to come in the name of Jesus. I know I have passion, but I do not want anything to hinder my passion. And I'm going to come and offer myself to the King of Kings right now. Maybe you're here and you're going to say, you know what? I, my passion was waning. I didn't understand it. I didn't know where it was coming from. But I heard the voice of the Spirit speaking. And right now what I want to do, I want to make it right. I want to make it right in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're coming saying, I've got a gift. I've, I've just not used it. I've got a, a gifting, a talent. I've not used it. But right now, I'm coming to offer it to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Listen, if the Lord speaks to you, if there's some kind of conflict, get it, get it fixed. If you've got uh, uh, unconfessed sin, go ahead and get it under the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you, Jesus. We love you. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Teach me to listen.
You know, I've discovered that uh, you can't always judge something by what you see on the outside. People are good sometimes at putting on smiles and, and appearing to be joyful. But on the inside, they 
they've been hurt. They're distraught. And sometimes it's just a word from the Lord to remind them, I know where you are and I, I know what you're dealing with. And I am well able. My wife gave a good word this morning. Sometimes he just wants us to stand still. Quit trying to work it out on your own. Quit trying to fix it on your own. Just stand still and let God deal with it. She stopped one verse too early that's become my verse in the last several months. Exodus 14, 14. I, well, maybe she did read it. But there's a different translation that I like what it says. It says, I will fight for you. You just need to be quiet. That's hard for me. But I've learned that sometimes what I have to do is not try to fix it with my words. Or I just need to, I need to let God do the, the fighting. And I just need to be quiet. I just need to be quiet. Father God, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word. I understand, Lord, sometimes in a congregation, there's their differing needs. their are differing desires for things. And I guess that's what I struggle with the most is trying to figure out how do I connect everybody in a room by style or content or even where they're walking with you. And yet, Lord, nobody knows that better than you do. And that's why we have to be dependent upon your Holy Spirit. I truly believe you're trying to take us somewhere and you're trying to help us with foundation. And while we need to expect things to come through the door and we need to have a culture of certain things here, it all emanates from people. And people have to have it together doesn't mean we're perfect doesn't mean we understand it all doesn't mean we're mature as we need to be doesn't mean we don't have room to grow but it does mean lord we understand the word we're, we're being led by your spirit and we're listening to your voice and if there are things in our life we need to deal with or we need to to come in contact with lord we're going to listen to your voice and we're going to deal with that i believe god you want to fill people with passion i believe god they're pe passionate people but sometimes lord you want to give us a fresh dose of passion you want to give us a new wave of glory. You want to give us a, a refilling of the Holy Ghost. And those are the things, Lord, that so impact us and help us for the days to come. I thank you for those that came around the altar. I thank you for those, Lord, who have committed to you to stay passionate, to guard their passion. I thank you for those, Lord, that came around the altar saying, listen, there, there are just some things that have caused me to lose my passion, but I want my passion back. I want my joy back. I, 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 want, I want my walk back like I've had and, Lord, you're going to do that today. I believe it in the name of Jesus. Now, Father God, I pray that as we get ready to leave this place, that God, we're going to walk in what we've heard today. I've mentioned to some this week that, that what happens inside this building is inspiration. But that, Lord, what, what you need to do, we need to take what has inspired us and use it to motivate us. So that when, when we walk out of the door, we don't leave the Word inside the building that inspired us. But we allow the inspiration to motivate us and we take the motivation out the door. And we figure out some way to implement what we heard. I pray today, God, that we'll go out of this room full of passion. And that passion will be evident in our conversation. It'll be evident in our face. It'll be evident in the way we walk. It'll be evident in the way we talk to people. So much so that people will say, what's different about you? Or, or what, what makes you like you are? They just open the door for us to tell them about the goodness of God and about our church. I pray that we'll use every opportunity to do what we can do, Lord, to invite people to come inside this building because I believe if they can just get in here, the glory of God will fall. This is an anointed place. This is a loving place. This is a merciful place. This is a place of repentance. And I'm grateful for those things. Go with us as we get ready to walk out the door. May we walk in the power of your spirit. And may you love on us. And may we love on you in ways we have not done in a long time. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost.